My senior year of high school, I decided to take AP Calculus BC, which essentially means you take the college equivalent of Calculus 1 and 2 in a single school year. And honestly, it was every bit as hard as it sounds. <laughs> Fortunately, I had an amazing math teacher named Mr. Goldgar. He's a kind of tall, lanky guy with bad knees, so he always spins around on a green rolly chair in class. <laughs> he has an endearing, sarcastic wit to him, and he genuinely cares about his students. And I was struggling in the class a lot. There was one exam in particular where I got a whopping 13. That's 13 out of 100. <laughs> Before this class, I almost never dropped below an 85 on anything. And after seeing this test, Mr. Goldgar gave me the choice to either stick with Calc 1 and 2 or to drop to just Calc 1. And suddenly, I felt my stomach sink to the floor. Like that feeling you get when your mom calls your full name from the other room, you know, middle name and all. Truly, I didn't really care about the number on the page, but it was the fact that I had a choice that made me reconsider whether I was cut out to do math at all. I was sitting in this tiny desk, sobbing, while Mr. Goldgard tried to comfort me, and I remember thinking to myself, maybe I'm just not a math person. I'll never forget it. He leaned across his desk and he said to me, I have seen your love and curiosity for math dying in my class, and I just don't want to see that happen anymore, regardless of what you choose. This entire time, I thought that this idea of being a math person was simply about being good at math. And because in my eyes I wasn't, I didn't see myself as a math person. What Mr. Goldgar made me realize was that being a math person was about curiosity. He saw past that 13% grade and saw someone that genuinely cared about math. And he was right. I absolutely loved math. When I walked outside, I didn't just see a road. I saw symmetries and stop signs, patterns in the clouds, raindrops as vectors falling from the sky. I mean, I joined the math team, spending my free time nerding out about the cool math outside of the normal curriculum. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh, I'm a certified nerd. In that moment, crying in Mr. Goldgar's classroom, I decided to stick with the class, and I decided for myself that I could do this, and that I did love math. I began to tell myself, I am a math person. Since that moment, I've been fortunate to have had many mentors that have nurtured that love for curiosity for mathematics, and I decided to become a high school mathematics teacher so that I could be the Mr. Goldgar for others. However, when I told many other people about wanting to be a math teacher, immediately they would launch into this series of horror stories about their terrible math teachers, stories of bright red ink marked all over exams, and of a deep-seated frustration with learning mathematics. Perhaps some of you in the audience have some of these stories yourselves. The question that confounds me the most is, why math specifically? We don't hear nearly as often, I'm not a history person, why is it that with mathematics, dreading it or outright hating it seems to be this unifying position? That by saying, I'm not a math person, is to make a statement of solidarity with others. To those in the audience who have memories and experiences like these, to those who are unconvinced that everybody's a math person, I'd like for you to consider for a moment, and this may or may not be true, but just consider it, that your perhaps complicated relationship with math might be a result of how you were taught math. That mathematics as a field of study may not be the problem, but rather the grades, the system, the infrastructure within which you learned it. And I would like to make very clear that my goal for you all is not that you should know the quadratic formula from memory, have a career in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or be able to quickly calculate the tip at a restaurant to impress your friends. That's not the point. Being a math person is about asking and following mathematical questions, which is something that we can all do. So in a moment, we're going to do some math together, but don't worry, there, is no, there are no grades, there is no test, we're adults now, and we're just going to do math for fun. <laughs> Many people don't think you can have fun in a math class. There's plenty of fun, plenty of jokes to be had in math. For example, have you heard the joke about the famous statistician? I'd say it's probable. <laughs> so 
So I'll begin by proposing a new working definition of mathematics. We need to start from the ground up. I'll give you this. Mathematics is the language of pattern. So in the same way that, say, music gives language to sound and emotion, mathematics gives language to pattern. That is, mathematics gives us a framework for thinking about things that happen, and we're able to make some kind of prediction as to what might happen next. Now, you'll notice in that definition that there is no mention of algebra, calculus, or trigonometry. That's because those are a few specific areas of math you may have learned about in school, but there's so much beyond them. All right, so we have a new definition of math. Let's talk about what that means. This is a tree. <laughs> it's a wonderful tree. And when you walk out of here on the front campus, you can actually see it. Now, this tree and most others as well are quite special because they can teach us about an idea in mathematics called self-similarity. Self-similarity, what does that mean? Well, to be similar in terms of geometry means that you can take something and rotate it, flip it, move it around, scale it bigger or smaller, and it still keeps its main properties. A square will still be a square, and a tree will still be a tree. But I specifically said self-similarity which would suggest that it's similar to itself. I'll show you. Look at this first tree branch on the left. I can take it, make it bigger, and it could feasibly be shaped like the branch before it. And I could take that branch and do the same thing, and it could be shaped like the branch before it. And I could keep going all the way until I arrive back at the base of the tree where the pattern kind of ends. What is remarkable about these structures is that they aren't isolated to only trees. Blood vessels, river deltas, neurons, lightning, all of these things and so much more show self-similarity. <laughs> these are a subset of objects in mathematics known as fractals, which share a Latin root with fractions, meaning that these are pieces and parts of a larger broken whole. So by taking a moment to ask a simple question like, why does this branch look like that branch? And following that question, we can begin to create some basis for an understanding that there's a mathematical reality shared by all these different things in nature. It begs another question. What other patterns are we not seeing when we disconnect mathematics from our world? And is my conviction and the reason I'm giving this talk today is that I believe when we disconnect ourselves from mathematics, when we say things like, I'm not a math person, we give ourselves and others permission to ask less questions. It means that when we look out into nature or we read some statistic in the news, we gloss over it rather than critically evaluating it. Let's unpack that a little. Consider this newspaper headline. New Postal Service is 95% effective. Now, if the average person read this, they might think, well, all right, that seems pretty good, and they might be inclined to trust this service to deliver their mail and packages on time. However, what if we took that number and changed it up a bit? So we have 95% effective. That's, on average, 95 out of 100 times it works. That means it doesn't work five out of 100 times. We can then simplify that five out of 100 to one in 20. Now suddenly, I might be able to write a new headline that says, new postal service loses one in 20 packages. Notice the number is the same. It's the same quantity, but the context is completely different. And now if I were reading this, I might be far more hesitant to trust this service to deliver my mail and packages on time. Also notice here that the number itself is not purely objective. As many people think that mathematics is purely objective because it's full of numbers and algebraic formulas. However, mathematics is the numbers and the words around these numbers. Now, why is this important? In our society, we are constantly inundated with graphs and statistics every day, whether we understand and ask questions about them or not. Think about how our world would be different if we stopped and asked questions about these things that we see every day, if we stopped to critically evaluate what these graphs and figures really mean. Asking questions like, 
What is the pattern here? What makes this true? Or what does this mean in context? In mathematics, and I believe in life, questions are often far more valuable than answers. So I'll leave you with this question. What would our world look like if everybody was a math person? <laughs>